Hello friends. Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night study. This is why we have the Psalms. This is our third uh, segment of this. So if you're joining us new for tonight, for the first time, you can go back and pick up the first two uh, installments of that. And um, I realize that we're just a couple of minutes early here. So just hopping on right now so that our church family can join us and while we can also share out the link on our various platforms which I'm going to do now myself see if I can do two things at once and uh, hopefully you don't lose me here I'm gonna share this out and then we're gonna jump in in uh, just about one minute here we go All right. All right, I've shared it out there on my end. Um, why don't you take a moment, go ahead and hit the share button on your end and tag a friend if you need to with that. And we're going to give it about one more minute here. We have a good group of people that are already building. While we're waiting, why don't you say hello? Let me know who's in, uh, who's on the other side of the screen out there. Leave me a comment and just love to connect for just a second. Who's out there tonight? Go ahead and leave, leave a comment real quick. I see heart emojis. I feel the love. I have no idea who you are, though. Who's out there? I see lots of people. Comments will come in here any second. It takes just a minute. Well, we will, while everybody's uh, everybody's joining, uh, just by way of announcement, wanted to uh, make you all aware, in case you didn't hear the announcement on Sunday or maybe during the week through social media, um, we are rolling out online small groups just as fast as we can. So um, if you'll go on to genuchurch.com and click on Group Life, you can see the various small groups that are open. There are many more groups that are not advertised there, but you can make sure to see the ones that are available. And so we hope that you'll join a group. Well, let's go ahead and uh, jump in here. So this is, this is why we have the Psalms part three, and tonight we're going to be looking at Psalm 139. So if you want to grab your Bible and uh, go ahead and get over there or pull it up on your screen. The Psalms, as we've said before, are prayers that we pray. Psalms are, uh, they were written as prayers. They were often set to music. And the Psalms give us language when we don't have language of our own. Um, the Psalms ride the swell of human experience and emotion. They go all the way up to the highest of mountaintops emotionally and experientially with God. And they also sink down into moments of angst and despair and feeling alone. And I just think that the Psalms are what we need right now, that the Psalms are exactly what we need. This is why we have the Psalms. And so the Psalms come to us as honest talk about God. They're just plain talk about life with God and and how to experience God in various seasons. And um, I just wanna, wanna say tonight that uh, we also want to, to make sure that you know, I wanna make sure that you know, this, this to me is not a one-way uh, experience tonight. There are other things that, um, that, you know, Sunday mornings we can only do, you know, so much in the preaching moment, right? We can't respond to, to comments and and that's that's by design at that moment how could we but but our church wanted to make sure that you know through these sessions like this that your voice is able to be heard so I'm loving seeing the comments that are happening in the morning bible studies and uh, those are ongoing pastor charlie's leading us through holy week and I want to encourage you if you haven't watched any of those yet go back and watch them and join them tomorrow at 9 uh, and those sessions are designed to where uh, you can make a comment and let your voice be heard. And this one is no different. Uh, we just want your voice to be heard in this. So if you've ever been in a Wednesday night session with me, you know that it's a dance. 
And so there's an ebb and there's a flow and we're in this thing together. So um, I certainly miss you. Wish I was in the room with you, but since I'm not, I want to hear your voice. And for whatever reason, I'm seeing literally no comments over here off to the side. So I know that you're out there. I know that you're commenting, uh, but I just can't see what those are. And I wish that I could, otherwise I would be responding to them, but they're just not popping up. So maybe that'll fix itself in a little bit and those will come crashing in upon us. Okay, now it's decided that it wants to, to do that. Well, without further delay, let's jump right into Psalm 139. And I wanna pray for you at the end uh, as well. So Psalm 139, it's a Psalm of David. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. My, make my bed in shale, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even in the darkness, it's not dark to you, the night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I'm still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So I want you to think about a person, a human person, because some would say, um, you know, this is the Lord, but I want you to think about a human person that knows you better than anyone else. Think about a human person that knows you better than anyone else. And go ahead and leave a comment there on who that person would be who knows you better than anybody else. I'll give you a moment to do that. Who's the person that you know who knows you better than anyone else? see here. Who knows you better than anyone else? Okay. I had to, I'm not seeing comments on my screen. I had to get my phone out. Oh, there you all are. 
Jody Mann says Christy Mann. Emily Jennings says Brent Jennings. Alicia Brown says my husband. Brandon Webster says Melanie Webster. I'm seeing a trend here. Colleen says Sean. Brandy says Jesse, her husband. Nicholas says Kristen, his wife. Jesse says his wife. Jennifer says my husband knows me better than I know myself. Will says Sherry. Kayla says my mother. Alex, my all-seeing and wise wife. Elsie says Mike. Jora says my mother. Jane says John. Tina says Chad. Tori says her husband and her mom. So many listing either mother or their uh, their spouse. How does it make you feel to be so deeply known? Because I think that to to be so deeply known is it's both comforting and it's a little unnerving it's a little unsettling at the same time because when somebody knows you that well like they they know all the stuff that comes with it and that can be a little like and sometimes we want to hide from that and other times it's it's so reassuring to know that we're known well the word know or known in this uh passage it actually comes up seven times. Now your translation might have it a little bit different, but in the Hebrew, anyhow, the, the word comes up seven times. It's the number of fullness or the number of completion. And so it might be a coincidence, but it might be that the psalmist was intentional in that and trying to say, God knows me fully and to completion. God knows me fully and to completion. And so that's the place we'll begin from tonight is with that understanding. So let's look at verses 1 through 4 here. Verses 1 through 4. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. So the Lord knows the psalmist completely. You see that the Lord knows the psalmist's deeds and the psalmist's thoughts and the psalmist's words. You know, my, you discern my thoughts. You're acquainted with all my ways, even before a word is on my tongue. For me, when I read that, that I think that that gives me a sense of hope and calm and peace that God knows me, knows my thoughts, knows my words, knows my actions. And at the same point in time, it instills me with, with a sense of fear. You could say holy fear if you want to dress it up. That God knows my thoughts and my actions and my words even before the words are formed on my tongue. There's an ancient rabbinic tradition, and the saying goes, reflect on three things and you will avoid transgression. You'll avoid the wrong path, the wrong thing. Reflect on three things. Number one, know where you came from. Number two, know where you're going. And number three, know before whom you will give an account. You know, you, you might put it on your desk at work. You might, you might write a little sticky note that says, know who you're working for or know for whom you're working. Because at the end of our days, we will give an account before the Lord. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Do we live with the realization that we will give an account to God? Do we live with the realization that we'll give an account to God? That verse in there that says, even before a word is formed on my tongue, you, you know it. You know it. I've been really convicted these past couple of days by the words that come out of my mouth. And if you're like me and you get to the end of the day and you ever look back on a day, you think, man, I could have handled that differently. I probably shouldn't have said that. The teachings of Jesus in our morning Bible readings, they, 
they, they just call us to the understanding that our words have power of life and death and that we'll give an account for every idle word. So if you're like me, and maybe this is you, if this is you, say, hey, this is, this is me. Do you ever find yourself saying something and you realize even while you're saying that something that you, you don't feel right about saying it, but you say it anyhow? Or somebody baits you with a question or asks you a question that you feel the need to jump in on, but you know in jumping in on it, you're going to slander somebody or gossip or go too far in what you say. And you just you feel it right before or as you're doing it. And yet, if you're like me, you go ahead and do it anyhow because you don't want you don't want to not respond or you you don't want to say too little because they'll think that you don't care. Anybody anybody like that? Well, we'll just pray that the Holy Spirit will just make us aware of the power of our words and that we would realize that we will give an account to God for every every word, every idle word um, that we say. And that gives me a certain sense of, of awe. It gives me a certain sense of fear. And uh, it just makes me want, want to watch my mouth a little bit. So Colleen says, yeah, that grievous impulse nature. Brandon says all the time. You know, the, the path to wisdom might just be silence. And so um, maybe we need, like, if you have a word count on Microsoft Word, maybe we need a, a word count to where we say fewer words, to where we say more intentional words. If God knows our, our words, even before they're formed on our tongue, that means that God, God can see them here. And so we just pray, Holy Spirit, before the words come out of my heart to my mouth, would you just give me a heart check? Just give me a heart check. So um, we'll go on to verse five here. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful to me, for me. It's high, I cannot attain it. So now we, we balance the reality that God knows us, warts and all as we say, with the understanding that God has hemmed us in behind and before. It's like a weaver metaphor that God has God has sewn us up. So we're secure. We're like, you know those swaddling things you put babies in? You just wrap them up. That's the imagery here that I that I think we can we can draw upon for a contemporary application that that God wraps us up and preserves our lives. God is like a weaver touching the fabric of our lives. God is very close. Oftentimes God is portraying scripture like a potter and you're the clay. But in this case God is like an artistic weaver and and your very life is the fabric that God is working with. He says this is too much. It's too much that God knows our thoughts and our deeds and our words and yet still wants to know us. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's it's high. I I can't attain it. The reality that that God knows me hems me in behind and before, knows my thoughts, my words, my actions, and yet still lays his hand on me. That's just the mystery. It's the mystery of the love of God for me, that God knows me so deeply. He knows my thoughts. He knows my words. He knows my anxieties. He knows my fears. He knows the time that I'm angry in my heart. He knows it, and yet he still lays his hand on me. He still hymns me in and behind and before, and God does that for you. And God wants to know you intimately. God wants to know you close. So don't let the fact that God knows all the things that you've done and are doing, don't let that push you away from God. God already knows it anyhow. Instead, let, that, let your weaknesses, let your fears, let your anxieties, let your addictions, let your sin, let that be something that drives you to your knees and say, God, you're so close. Your hand is on me. I, I just, I, I hope that you, you know my heart, that I love you up underneath all of this, and, and just help me with my words and help me with my actions. David is, if anything, David is honest to God, and you and I can be honest with God. To be fully known is to be vulnerable. Sari was just telling me that Pastor Luke was talking about vulnerability. That when we confess, we're showing that we're vulnerable. Before God, when we're vulnerable before God, God can bring healing to our soul. And when that happens, the joy is restored. Aren't, aren't you? Oh, teary-eyed tonight. I wish we could edit this. Are you grateful? 
that our, our teenagers are getting this so young in life, and don't you wish you had it? Aren't you grateful for Pastor Luke and Pastor Akira and what they're doing? It's so amazing to hear my daughter say the same thing that I'm about to tell you, and she's saying it at 14 years old to me. You see, there, there is a difference between transparency and vulnerability. And transparency is just like, here's what's going on, here I am, and you know, you're just kind of all out there. A lot of people are transparent, but the difference between transparency and vulnerability is that vulnerability welcomes feedback. It, it, it opens itself up to being injured. It opens itself up to healing. I can be transparent, and it's a one-way relationship. But vulnerability is a two-way relationship. And so to be vulnerable before the Lord means that, God, I'm open to you coming in who knows my thoughts and my words and my heart and my actions. I'm open to you coming in and bringing healing. You're like the, you're the weaver that can mend up all of the holes. God, would you bring healing to me? So God doesn't just want your transparency. God doesn't want you just to tick off your list before him. God doesn't want your transparency. God wants your vulnerability. So be vulnerable before God. Let prayer be honest. Prayer is just being honest before God. Here's what's going on, and you already know it anyhow. So in the comments here, now that I can see them, um, would you do me a favor, and would you respond with either the number one or the number two? So here's the question. Which one resonates the most with you? Number one, the fact that God knows you deeply, and that's unsettling. Or number two, the fact that God knows you deeply, and it's reassuring. So respond with number one, if, if the fact that God knows you, heart, mind, actions, all that, if that feels more unsettling, and number two, if that feels more reassuring. And I just want to see, I want to see what you're thinking about here. So many of you are, are just blowing up the comments section. I love it. I love to hear your voice. Let's see what you're saying here. I'm just, I'm waiting on the comments to come in. Okay, I see a two, 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 two. Lots of twos. Lots of twos. That's good. Two is, two is the, the posture of beginning. Two is the posture of heart for the beginning of spiritual growth. Two is the posture of heart for the continuing of spiritual growth. Because if, if the fact that God knows you intimately always makes you afraid, then you're never going to be able to take that step to where you're really vulnerable with God. And so I want to encourage you, if you are like, ah, I'm one, but I don't know if I want to put one, um, then I would, I would say realize that God's intentions towards you are good and that God already knows all that stuff, and God weeps over that stuff. I don't even know if God is angry as much as God is heartbroken. So why don't we just say, God, you can have it and help me. So, um, number seven, verse seven. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? You know, where can I go from your spirit? Spirit language goes all the way back to Genesis chapter one, verse two. The, the spirit hovered over the chaotic, formless, deep, um, that, that, the, the, the language, um, how you say it, metaphorically or visibly is, is of the spirit brooding over the waters, over the, the formless deep, the spirit, the presence of God is there. So when we talk about spirit, we're talking about presence. So where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? And in the following verses, he mentions, can I, can I go up to heaven? Can I, Ride on the wings of the morning, I think it said. Uh, the, it mentions the sea. All of that is called back to Genesis language when God formed Adam and had an intimate relationship with Adam. Where could Adam go from the one who formed him and everything? Where could Adam go? Where could I go from your spirit? So the, the psalmist is laying out his feelings that wherever he goes, God is already there. All right, so let's go, let's look briefly at verses 7 to 12. I'm going to reread them unless we've forgotten, okay? And then we're going to progress. So if you're sitting there going, my goodness, there's 24 verses. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm not, not going to cover all of them in depth. So where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I take the wings of the morning, or if I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. 
I say, surely the darkness will cover me, and the light about me is night. Be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Verse 8 always stands out to me if I make my bed in Sheol. And so Sheol is just the place of the grave. It's the place where you feel furthest. It's, it's the place where David's ancestors, Abraham and Isaac, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and so on, it's where they rested. So could I go up to the highest heavens or could I go to the place of the grave? He gives the most, the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. And I just want to give you a little, little thought here briefly as an aside. We're, we're uh, moving headlong into Holy Saturday. And Holy Saturday is the day that Christians usually leap over. They, they leap right from crucifixion to resurrection. But remember, there's a day in the middle. And it's a day of holy hush. It's a day of, of despair. Of wondering, where is, where, is, where is Jesus? What happened to our Savior? What happened to our Lord? But in the... In the tradition, Holy Saturday is held to be the day where the Spirit goes into the grave and sits with the Christ. So on Holy Saturday, it's the day where the Spirit enters the grave and cradles the Christ because love will not let love die alone. You see, I think that sometimes in our situations where we wonder, where is God? Why isn't this changing? Why isn't God delivered me? There's so much deliverance language in the Old Testament. God is conqueror. God is mighty. God is powerful. What happens when God doesn't show up in the way that you expect? Well, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that's open, what you understand is that the Spirit does the best and the most like any loving parent and sometimes the best and the most that God can do because God gives us free will. Sometimes the best and the most that God can do in a situation is to come in and to enter into our suffering and our pain with us like the Spirit did with Christ and to hold our hearts and to sit with us. See, sometimes the Spirit doesn't deliver us out of a situation. Sometimes the Spirit delivers hope in the situation in the midst of despair. So if you have a God who always conquers, always delivers, always is powerful, what do you do whenever life falls apart? You have to shift your focus and open your heart to the reality that sometimes God doesn't deliver you out of something. Sometimes God delivers hope in the middle of something. And God will never let you suffer alone. But the Spirit remained with Jesus on Holy Saturday, and then the Spirit resurrected Jesus in a whole new form on Sunday morning. And the resurrection on the other side of the crucifixion might not look exactly like what you thought it was going to look like. The, the way that you think you're going to go through this whole situation and the way things are going to be on the other side of it might be completely different than your expectations, but your expectations are not what are important. What's important is that you're open to the Holy Spirit resurrecting what the Holy Spirit wants to resurrect out of your death, your pain, your despair, your loss, your grief. And that's why we can trust that God is always with us and knows our deepest heart, knows our longings, and will give us what we need when we need it. All right, verses 13 to 18. We'll read that, and then we're going to land the plane here in just a moment. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made your works. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, in intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast the sum of them. If I were to count them out, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. That weaver imagery again, God being intimately familiar with you, God forming you fearfully, wonderfully. 
You see, I think in one of the things we need to realize, and this is this is like the whole of, of Christian experience in so many ways, that we're to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, but we can't love our neighbor until we properly love ourselves. But we realize that in order to love ourselves, we find that we properly love ourselves when we love other people. So it's but you got to begin at the beginning. The beginning is receiving God's love for you and accepting God's love for you and loving yourself with the love that God has given you in Christ. Accepting yourself, realizing that God sees you and loves you as you are. Your fundamental nature is not fallen. You see, the first word about humankind in the scripture is not that we are fallen. The first word about humankind in scripture is good. Now, yes, you, you are fallen. You do have a sinful nature. You're not everything you're going to be as Christ continues to mature you by the power of the Holy Spirit until the day where we look him in the eye and we we see him and we're full and we're complete. But the, the core of who you are is not wicked and evil. The core of who you are is a child of God. So if you have this doubt language and this shame language on yourself, you need to, you need to get a, a biblical perspective because you're thinking thoughts about you that are actually sinful. So stop sinning in the way that you think about yourself. Instead, think, I'm a child of God. I'm the beloved of God. God loves me. God sees me. God knows me. And God formed me very, very well with good intentions. God doesn't create any person with, the, with like a, a, a hatred toward that person, person because the fundamental nature of God is love. And the fundamental nature of love is to give of love self to other people. So how precious are your thoughts, O God? I want to know the thoughts of God. And I hope you do too. So verses 19 to 22, you know, I wanted to leave it out, but I can't because it's there. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. With complete hatred. I hate them with complete hatred, the psalmist says. Not just partial hatred. No, I've measured it. I hate them completely, 100%. Hatred. Big old frowny face emoji. Hate you. I count them my enemies. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. The guy who said all of that, <laughs> the guy who said all of that says, search me. And if there's anything going on in here that you want to get rid of, let me know. Here's the deal. The Psalms put language like that in there because it invites you to pray it out so you don't have to act it out. See, if you can pray it out in the presence of God, you don't have to act it out in the presence of other people. If you can say, God, I am totally miffed. I hate that person. I'm mad about that person. They're your enemy. They're my enemy. I know you don't like them. God, you're going to have to deal with them. But the psalmist always leaves the revenge, the vengeance, the retribution. The psalmist always leaves that in the hand of God. And so you're to be completely honest before God. Go ahead and be vulnerable with God. But at the end of the day, realize That vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. That's not up to you. So can you make this your prayer with the psalmist? Search me, O God. Know my heart. Because God already knows you. So I want to just pause here at the end. Somebody, Crystal Belk, says he doesn't leave the real feelings out. No, the Bible doesn't have any plastic saints. You see the full contour and character of these people. And... uh, It's powerful. That's why I love the Psalms, because they're honest. Looking here, Kathy says, that's real life. That is real life. Yeah, pray it out so you don't have to act it out. Good. Hey, before we close up here at the end, um, I just want to ask, I want to ask if I can pray for you. I just had it on my heart to take a couple moments here. This this isn't... um, you know, I've, sometimes I travel far and wide on the internet and I, I see things that are really, you know, just other states, other churches, whatever. I see things that are just so, they're just so perfect. It, it, my light, my lighting is, here's my lighting, okay? This is raw. And this is, and I, I want you to know that, that we, we miss you. We love you. We, we're here for you. We're praying for you. Your pastor loves you and is praying for you. Pastor Charlie's getting on there every day, loving you, praying for you, giving you the word of God, walking you through Holy Week. I'm loving the approach that he's taking with that. 
Jesus did this and then he did this. I was talking to my mom today. She said, I just love the way Pastor Charlie explains things. And I thought that's that's because that's because we we see we're real and we see our people. And so we know where you are. So I want to just ask here, how can we pray for you? How can we pray for you? Anybody? You guys are still just throwing out truth. I've got all night. You can also fill out the prayer request card online and uh, we'll be sure to pray for you. Kathy says here, after he prayed for God to slay the wicked, he says, search me, O God, know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. He showed his true emotions to the Lord and that set him free. Well, I'll just close in prayer and just and pray for uh, pray for you. Know that we love you. Know that each and every one of our pastors, Pastor Jeff is back home from sabbatical now. Um, Pastor Charlie going Facebook Live in the mornings. We're going to shift gears next week. You're going to hear from another one of our team. And um, just know that we're here for you guys. I see Crystal's prayer there. All right. I see y'all. Kathy's got a new small group starting tomorrow night. She wants us to pray for that. Pray for her new small group starting tomorrow night. You can see more info about that online. What else? Pray that I pray it out and God shuts my mouth and searches me. Pray for creativity with my family. Pray that as we are together as a family, we grow closer. Cynthia says, my anxiety is overly active. That took courage. Well, Father, you, you see each person. And I just, I ask that you will, I, I, I'll pray first for Cynthia, God. I pray that you will help her um, in this time that's so hard for people who have uh, issues with anxiety. I, I pray in the name of Jesus that she would find you in this moment, that she would find you here with her in this moment, that you already know all of the situation, but that she would she would center in on this moment. And as she breathes in and she breathes out, that she would be right here with you in this moment, knowing that the God who formed her in her mother's womb and that the God who will one day resurrect her in Christ is the God who is with her now. God, I pray for creativity and family. I pray that um, in these times where we're just locked up together, um, that you will continue to give us what we need. Yeah, Jora is talking about the stress and anxiety. Pray for safety for Amanda Sylvie and the safety of the co-workers and EMS and all healthcare facilities. Prayers for our nation. God, we lift up all of our healthcare workers. We lift up our president. Wherever we stand politically, you've commanded us, you've commanded us, God, to have respect and reverence for those in authority. And so we lift up our president. I just want to say, if you can't pray for your president, the problem's not him, the problem's you. So God, I, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will bless Donald Trump. You will give him wisdom and insight. You will surround him with wise voices. You will give him everything that he needs to lead this country during this time. God, I pray for all of the churches all across our country that are going to be finding creative ways, God, to do church on Sunday morning. God, I pray that you will just bless them, that there will be a great harvest, that so many people will come into the kingdom of God during this weekend. Eileen says, pray that I lean on you, God, in all this uncertainty, isolation, and loneliness during this pandemic. From Elaine. Well, friends, we, we will. And I, I hope that you, as you, even as you get off here tonight, that you will go through these comments and you will just lift up your sisters and your brothers in prayer. Because that's what's going to turn the tide, is the people who are praying. 
I sure love you. I'm, I'm so grateful to be part of this body of Christ during this time. I'm so grateful for our small group leaders that are stepping up. They're here for you, and I would just encourage you, uh, go online and join a small group. And you, you may not need anything out of it, but somebody may need what you bring to the table. So pick Kathy Deming's group, or pick the Tuesday night women's Bible study that just started yesterday, or there's so many that are on there that I just encourage you to find, find a place. And um, we're just going to keep walking this out together. And so we'll see you on Wednesday night of next week. For this is why we have the Psalms. And then I want to encourage you to join Pastor Charlie as we go headlong. I, what he was saying this morning is that it picks up speed starting on Thursday. So don't miss tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. on Facebook Live. Make sure you tune in. He's got a word for you there. We love you, church. God bless you, and we will see you soon. Bye-bye.